good morning. This is Monday, July 13th, and the scripture reading I selected for today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians is the um, first writing of the New Testament, so it's the earliest writing. So this is capturing Paul's thoughts. We, we refer to uh, many of Paul's epistles or letters as occasional letters, uh, not that he wrote infrequently. That's my sin. Uh, occasional means that um, he's responding to an occasion and that's what warranted his response to these uh, budding Christian communities. So let me read this and I'll comment on, on that a little bit more. But this is 1 Corinthians 4, 13. Paul writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So I'm going to speak to the fact that um, of how we as Lutherans would interpret, or we as Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, I can't speak for other Lutherans, but how we would interpret this within our, our larger theology. We'd say the occasion, or the primary occasion for Paul's letter, Paul writing the Thessalonians, was after Jesus died, was resurrected, and then ascended into heaven, there was an anticipation of his imminent return. And by imminent, I can't tell you whether that was weeks, months, days, or years. But certainly by this go-round, uh, by the time of Paul's writing, we're past a decade of when Jesus had ascended into heaven. And people had begun dying in these Christian communities. And the question was being asked, what happens? What's going on? Jesus has not returned, and now people are dying. And so this is part of Paul's response to that, um, to that question. This particular passage has been picked up in American, primarily evangelical Christianity. Um, it got coupled with uh, some writings by, I can't remember the gentleman's name now, um, I'm gonna get it wrong because I'm gonna say uh, Snopes, which is the which is the website you can check out for whether something's true or false. Um, but this got bundled together in what became a real convoluted rapture theology, and that's not how the church itself understood it for 1850 years, and how much of the world Christianity still does not understand it. But we have a, a, a brand within Christianity that takes this, links it with Daniel and a couple other things, and comes up with a whole lot. Um, I read it primarily for the hope that it dictates, and I would say the ultimate hope that even when folks have died, the promise is um, that we will be resurrected. Now I'll skip over real briefly to another of Paul's writings, and this is Romans, which is one of his last writings. So you can see how maybe some of his things have evolved. So Paul writes in the 8th chapter of Romans, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it had never put this together till just this moment because I'm preparing sermon or looking forward to the sermon for this coming Sunday and it's the wheat and the tares and it's a it's as Jesus explains it at the end it'll be the angels who come and separate the good and evil 
And so I'd never put that together with this Roman text where Jesus, where Paul writes, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels dot, 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 will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, like I said, that epiphany just came to me live and in color, <laughs> as is often happens. And so I don't know if I'll make anything of that throughout this week of musings before next Sunday's sermon, but it definitely is one of those connections that I've never made before today. Well, I spoke of that being the ultimate hope. I say that because one time, and it was very early on in my pastoral ministry, I was called to preside at a funeral in uh, Bluffton. And as happened, uh, Sun City is a huge community down there. And what happens occasionally is that people um, plot out their retirement and it doesn't go the way they'd anticipated. And in this particular instance, it went very bad in that a couple had just relocated, so they really hadn't connected with anybody local. And then the spouse died, she died. And I was called on by the funeral home to prepare the funeral service. Well, compounding that was that the folks really weren't, well, they definitely were not part of a faith community, but in fact, faith had played really no role in their whole lives. And so, um, but they wanted some words to be spoken and the funeral home called me. The service itself was held basically in a conference room. It was the father, or sorry, the husband and a son and me and one person from the funeral home. And I said, you know, as a Christian pastor, I'm gonna proclaim the gospel, the good news as I believe it. But it was such a hollow feeling to be with people who in their grief thought this was it. It was over, that the loving memories they had of their spouse or their mom and all the wonderful contributions she had made with her life, but that was it. That was the end. And um, it just, like I said, it left me with such a hollow feeling for them. And my hope is that at some point in time, um, not because I fear for their souls, not at all. I wish for them, I hope for them, a hope that says that nothing separates us from God's love, not even disbelief. I hope that this woman after, after death, while we as humans are so bound by the construct of time and God is beyond time, I really hope there might be one great surprise afterwards, which is for anybody who doesn't believe, they get enough of a glimpse to say, how about now? <laughs> And that moment to say, oh my God. Um, so that's my hope for people. Other hopes beyond that ultimate, and this is just this morning as I was going through Facebook prior to, saw wonderful photos of Kathy Harris as she and Donnie are within about three weeks or so of expecting their second child and the joyful anticipation and hope that that brings. I saw a father and a daughter that had gone on a wonderful hike to waterfalls and just brought a smile to my face. Um, knowing in the past week the joy that a new <laughs> litter of kittens has brought to multiple families at University Lutheran, um, I'm lobbying for that mother, the, the mama kitten to be renamed Grace because she just appeared and was not an anticipated or expected, but has been lovingly welcomed in the Rocco household. And those kittens are now um, bringing joy to other families or anticipated joy to other families. I got to participate in the a Zoom uh, renewal of vow ceremony for Penny and Bruce Boer celebrating the 50th anniversary of their wedding. And so to see friends and family on Zoom gathered from literally as far away as Alaska to you name it, to, joy, to celebrate their joy and the hope that they have, um, to being made aware of scans that have come back negative, which is a positive 
no signs of cancer. Uh, what hope? So in the midst of a lot of trials and tribulations that are going on uh, throughout the world and certainly in our country right now, uh, to celebrate with the community some of these joys and hopes. So let me close with a word of prayer. Holy God, thank you for this new day. Thank you for the signs of life that are around, even in the midst of a deadly pandemic. So we pray for your spirit to comfort those who are grieving, to give strength to those who are battling the disease, to continue to give strength and compassion and rest to all of our healthcare workers as they minister in the most difficult situations, for staff at nursing care facilities and assisted living as they continue to not only help uh, their neighbors, but also to be family, as family is often restricted from visiting. Be with all those who just are needing to go to hospitals for the normal things in life and can't have family members by their side as they're receiving treatment, as they are going through surgical procedures. Um, so for the extra burden that our doctors, nurses, staffs at hospitals are doing to, to um, know how grateful we are for their sacrifice, for their dedication. So help us as those that have the luxury of being able to do the right thing, um, do that this day to keep others safe, to show our love for our neighbors by wearing our masks in public, by maintaining physical distancing, by doing whatever we can to halt the spread of this virus. Fill our hearts with hope and joy. And this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Pastor Josh will be with you tomorrow, and I will see you on Wednesday. And God's peace and hope be with you. Bye-bye.